Hello, welcome, and thank you for joining this Safety Culture World Webinar titled Traditional to Transformational, Proven Steps to a Safety Culture Breakthrough. I'm Abby Fansler with Caterpillar Safety Services, and I will facilitate today's event. Before we begin, I have a couple of announcements. To ensure a good listening, listening experience for everyone, all participant phone lines are muted. We do encourage you, however, to submit questions and comments. You can do so by communicating with me, Abigail Fansler, using chat or Q&A uh, in WebEx. We will use the final 10 to 15 minutes today for your questions. Also, this event is being recorded. The recording and a PDF version of the slide deck will be posted to safety.cat.com. You will receive an email notification once those materials have been uploaded. Now, I am pleased to introduce our presenter, Doug Giesinger. Doug is a senior safety consultant with Caterpillar Safety Services. Before joining this team, Doug was a Caterpillar customer who used the zero incident performance process to achieve operational excellence through safety culture improvement at a major Canadian utility. He is a Canadian registered safety professional with more than 20 years of safety related work experience. As a Caterpillar safety culture expert, Doug spends most of his time on the road working with companies in a variety of industries across North America to apply the concepts and tools he will share with you today. And with that, Doug, let's get started. Well, thank you, Abby, and thank you, everyone, for participating in today's webinar. And today we're going to be talking about transition. The Oxford Dictionary defines transition as the process or a period of changing from one condition to another. And when you think about it, transition can be quite complex and even complicated. And when you're thinking about transitioning from traditional safety processes to zero injury processes, that can be quite true. And here's a bit of news before we get going. This isn't a start and finish process. It's a continuous journey that takes effort and a strong commitment and support from all levels of employees from frontline to the CEO. Our overview for today is that upon completion of this webinar, you should be able to understand why industry has been doing, what industry has been doing for decades only gets us so far. You should be able to understand some of the proven safety management principles and somewhat identify what you need to do to change to achieve a zero incident culture. This slide will indicate some of the critical characteristics that got us where we are today. And I don't say that in a negative, a negative way. Um, traditional safety processes have brought injury rates down over the decades to a point where we are performing much, much better than we ever have. However, um, I want to make it clear right now that portions of those characteristics are necessary and do have a, a key role to play. So traditional safety processes are, are a, a very good thing, and we have to have those um, well implemented um, in order to make the change to get us to a zero injury culture. And when you look at government agencies uh, implementing regulations, what we can say is government agency implementation of regulations, those, in, those regulations um, are very much what we call written in blood in that uh, someone had to, to, to die or the fatality or some you know, extreme event that forced government to say, listen, you know, we have to put some regulations around this kind of stuff to help employees um, uh, maintain or employers maintain a, a level of safety. And um, it laid down rules for the game, as they still do today. And the only problem with basing your entire system simply on those is that it doesn't do a very good job of telling you how to comply. And really, it's not the interest, the, uh, the uh, responsibility of, of governments to do that. So um, the industry focus on compliance, safety regulations, and codes is, as a response to the governmental minimum standards, organizations started to focus on compliance to the standards and started to get results. Um, safety was an addition, an addition to the workplace. Um, you know, it was considered as a new initiative decades ago, but you know, it was based solely on compliance. As well, a lot of the um, traditional processes are strictly just based on elements, and organizations started developing elements of a safety program. And I'm sure that uh, some of you have your uh, safety 
process broken down into elements of best practices and policies and procedures or other defining statements. And this method is and remains an effective way to organize who will do what, when, or how often. But for the most part, safety in some organizations and some industries still is seen as a bolt-on. So it's considered separated from the real job of doing business. We also have a success measures that are based on lagging indicators only. Uh, because the goal is zero injuries, many com companies see that as their as they see that as their entire focus. Uh, personal goals and company goals and rewards are based solely on achieving zero. And when you reward solely on achieving zero and nothing else, um, the message becomes do whatever you can to get zero, which really it doesn't lend itself well to. Uh, building a stronger safety culture. Um, also, uh, there's a commendable safety intention. And what is meant by that is that in traditional safety processes, we hear leaders at all levels communicate the importance of safety and how it is a priority or better yet, a value. Um, and this is commendable. You know, and it's something that has to be communicated and believed. But typically it stops there without much in the way of, of defined action and uh, we'll be talking about that later on in the, in the, in the webinar. What you see on your screen right now is what we call a traditional incident reaction cycle. And this is how it works. An injury occurs or a, a catastrophic, catastrophic event occurs. Management reacts. So what they'll do is they'll, uh, they'll say, oh my goodness, you know, we've had, a, we've had a fatality or our injury rates have gone through the roof. We have to do something. And then you see an increase of activities. Uh, perhaps, you know, organizations will look for uh, the magic wand or the silver bullet. Uh, you know, they'll look to organizations that will tell them, oh, you know, we, we have a process that will help you to improve your, your safety records. And, you know, they'll implement some of that stuff. And... What happens is, is that you'll see some, some improvements, you know, you'll see some, some uh, uh, prevention of injuries and that sort of thing. But what happens most of the time is that we slide into what we call business as usual. So there's a very less of a focus again on those safety activities and the cycle goes on again and another injury occurs. When I ask the question of the group, and you think about this when I ask you this question, what is important to your organization? But typically, when we ask this question, some of the answers that we get include things like, you know, making money or production, uh, employee satisfaction, quality, and inevitably, safety comes up in the list as well. So when you ask yourself this question, one of the follow-ups to it is, can you tell us or tell me what you do on a day-to-day -day basis to put a paycheck in your pocket? Otherwise, what are the things that you do, what are your defined activities that you're measuring on to get to the production end or the making money end of your company? You told us that that was important. And for the most part, people can. When they start thinking about it, they can say, well, you know, I do have these activities that I can, I can uh, vocalize. I, I know that I have to do this, 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 and this in order to you know, keep my job. Uh, um, and these are the things that I'm being measured on as far as my day-to-day -day work goes. Now, what's interesting is that when we say that production and safety rank right up there with what's important to your organization, the logical question next is, well, what safety activities are you measured on? What safety activities do you do on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis, the ones that you are actually measured on? And that's where we start to get a little fuzzy because what we find is that we don't typically have identified safety activities or safety um, actions uh, based on a, a, a safety activities in our day-to-day -day operations. We may see some of them at a frontline level where, you know, a supervisor might have uh, a responsibility to do a 
monthly safety meeting or you know uh, uh, job safety analysis stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. But when you start getting up the chain to middle-level managers and upper-level management, it starts to fall apart in that they don't have any uh, safety, defined safety activities that fall into place with that. So that's one of the uh, issues that uh, we're going to be talking about as we go through this process today. What you see on the screen right now is, is typically what happens over a period of years with the traditional safety management system in place. And this kind of a trend has been seen in, in, in various industries all over the world. Um, when you look at you know, back in the, in the 70s and stuff, we really started putting a focus on more of the compliance issues. We saw a steep drop in through the 80s and through the 90s, but you can see where it starts to plateau. And that's the same, and that's very, very true, like I say, in many industries. I'm going to give you an example of our own uh, Caterpillar results. Uh, this, uh, this particular slide is an actual um, slide of the uh, enterprise safety results for Caterpillar. And it almost looks exactly like the, the uh, example I showed you on the last slide. And um, it's, a, it's a perfect example of the phenomenon. We'll try various programs that help us to uh, uh, alleviate this somewhat, but it leaves us with traditional measures and management uh, uh, theories of, of uh, managing safety. And the problem is that it doesn't really bring about true change in culture. And to do that, organizations have to try a different approach, uh, one that works in harmony with traditional system systems and drives change. And really, if, uh, if we don't do that, well, what happens is, is that we can't expect any different results. And that's uh, clearly communicated in the definition of ins uh, insanity by Albert Einstein. When Albert Einstein says, you know, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So think about that. You've got a traditional safety process, you know, it deals with rules and tools, regulations, compliance, and we've been in that process for, you know, decades, and we really don't see a really big change, it plateaus. So with that said, um, that leads us right into our next slide. And this is a model of uh, why incidents happen and where the uh, effect of culture has an effect on incidents. So in this slide, we'll see that we have a result here, let's call that an incident or an injury. When we look at the basic causes of injuries, what we find is the vast majority of those basic causes have something to do with unsafe or at-risk behaviors. So there's always some sort of at-risk behavior, unsafe behavior that, is a, that creates a result and, uh, of, a, of an injury. I can have an energized piece of equipment uh, and it, it by itself really wouldn't cause me any injury unless I had some sort of interaction with it, some sort of behavior. And um, these at-risk behaviors uh, may be something that is not necessarily uh, the part of employee negligence. When we think about at-risk behaviors, oftentimes we'll think about, oh, someone taking a shortcut, uh, you know, someone uh, bypassing on purpose a safety um, lockout or, or another piece of safety equipment. At-risk behaviors can be caused partially not only by, by negligence, but it can be caused partially by um, employees' uh, ignorance of the, of the hazard. They might not know that this hazard exists. Perhaps they're new employees. Uh, perhaps what they've seen is a demonstration by their, their peers and a demonstration by their, um, their uh, supervisors and the people in, that they look up to, like their mentors, doing the same thing. So they repeat that behavior. So these behaviors, these at-risk behaviors, don't necessarily mean that someone is being negligent. Those at-risk behaviors are really um, affected by our attitudes, our beliefs, and our ideas. What we believe to be true, what we believe to uh, you know, be, be the way we do things, definitely affects how we behave. Those are dictated by the norms. You know, what's normal for this company? What's normal for this, this uh, department? Uh, we can see this on a, 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 like a day-to-day -day basis. What is it that we do day in and day out that really affects our attitudes and our beliefs and our ideas? Our 
attitudes, beliefs, and ideas affected by our norms, in essence, at the very top, relates directly to our culture. And that's ultimately what we're talking about, is how do we get to the point where we can change our culture so that the norms of our company and the norms of our departments and our, our, the norms of our groups change, uh, therefore affecting our attitudes, beliefs, and ideas that will eventually end up in safe behaviors with the result of, uh, to, to all result of zero injuries. So it's the culture that we need to look at because when you think about it and when you do enough incident investigation, what you realize is that a lot of the root causes of, of any incident have their basis, if you will, in the culture and norms of your department. So now we talked about this idea of uh, culture and safety culture. That begs the question, uh, what is a safety culture? You know, think about that for a second. What do we mean by safety culture? Well, some of the answers that we get when we ask this question in some of our courses is this. It's how we do things here. Uh, what we do without thinking. Here's a good one. What we do when the boss isn't around. Uh, you know, what we do when the safety person isn't walking down the, the, uh, the aisle. Uh, and it's all really as a result of our backgrounds, our experience in, a, uh, in our industry practices. So when we talk about safety culture, this is what we're talking about is, 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 how, it is how it is day in and day out that we, that we manage our safety process. You know, whether the safety process is seen as a, as a bolt-on or whether it really is part and partial of the way we do business. The next slide it, it illustrates a model that we use often. This is called the six criteria for safety excellence. And it was developed by Dr. Dan Peterson. And if you're in the safety uh, business, you'll, uh, you'll know uh, who Dr. Dan Peterson is. Uh, Dr. Dan Peterson is a PhD who, who spent many years studying uh, safety and what makes uh, zero, injury, zero injury culture possible. And him and his group came up with these six criteria for safety excellence. And when we look at them, what we can see is that there are a few of them that are very prescriptive, and there are a couple of them that are sort of uh, uh, um, more um, sort of qualitative than, than the rest. And I'm going to go through them one by one here. The first one is that top management is visibly committed. What this means is, is that we've got top management that is going beyond good intentions. Now, they still vocalize good intentions. Uh, we talked about that before. That's, that's extremely important. That still needs to take place. But top management being visibly committed is, it, it, what it means is that your top management supports uh, zero injury culture. They support and they look for accountability from the people that are reporting to them through the ranks on having uh, um, a good culture that has defined safety activities and they're being held accountable for it. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that your top management has to be you know, visibly present in your department every month or every week or every you know, semi-annual. When you get into a zero injury culture change process, you'll see all kinds of activities that are made possible by top management's visible commitment. So that, you know, when you look at a, the six criteria for excellence and, and the things that you need to put in play in order to, uh, to have a, a zero injury culture and make that transition, that's the, the top. That's one of the very, very important ones. The next one we see is that middle level management is actively involved. And what we mean by that is, again, it doesn't necessarily mean that middle level managers are going to be seen in departments and going to be touring through or whatever. What it means is, is that their activities include safety. So they have defined safety activities as well, just as well as the frontline supervision does and just as well as the top management would. And the middle level management being actively involved means that they have to support frontline supervision. We're going to talk about that next, but they have to support frontline supervision and they have to be involved to the point where they know what the processes are resulting in. So that the middle level management is actively involved. Typically, when we look at traditional safety processes, this is probably the area of management that gets missed the most. Um, a lot of times we'll see frontline supervision 
that does have some defined safety activities in their day-to-day -day activities. Uh, we see crop management being, being, being somewhat visibly committed through good intentions. And sometimes middle management kind of gets left out. So middle level management actively involved is very, very important to this criteria for safety excellence. The next we see is that frontline supervision being performance focused. And what that means is that frontline supervision is going to have to ensure that the safety, defined safety activities for themselves and for the frontline folks is happening. And when you think about it, what you'll see is that frontline supervision is fairly close to the frontline where probably the majority of the, of the higher hazard work is being done. So these folks uh, are, are busy people. So their supervision is absolutely important. It has to be performance focused so that they are doing everything that they can and they're being held accountable through their middle level management to doing the safety activities that they have to do on a day-to-day -day basis. The next bullet talks about employees being actively involved and employees uh, actively participating. And again, what this means is that the system has to be built in such a way that not only do employees have ownership in the process, but they're actively participating. They are willing to do the safety activities um, that, uh, that need to be done in order to mitigate hazard. They're seeing as this, this as something valuable, and they're actively participating and giving feedback um, and the like to improve the process. The last two bullets have less to do with prescription for action. And the fourth or the fifth bullet you see there is that the system is flexible to accommodate the culture. This is very important. When, par when companies partake and embark on system changes in a zero injury culture uh, change process, um, sometimes what happens is that they'll develop solutions that uh, they figure will work for the entire department or their entire company and they launch those processes and they try to implement them and they find out very quickly that they're not flexible enough to accommodate the culture. So that's really important that when you go through this process of continually improving, that your system remain flexible so that what works in one department is flexible enough to work in another department or another organizational area of your company. As well, we have to be flexible enough to accommodate advances in technology um, differences between generations create some opportunities to use different technology. And we have to be aware of that when we are, are embarking on a transformation from traditional to, uh, to a zero injury culture. We have to be cognizant and aware that we have to be flexible. The last one talks about a safety system that is positively perceived by the workforce. And what we mean by positive perception by the workforce is that we truly understand what it is that all of our employees think about our process. What is their perception? Because really that's their reality. This can be done in many ways, but one of the successful ways that, is, that um, measures this is what we call a safety perception survey. That's probably one of the key tools being used to me measure positive uh, uh, perception by employees. It's a very, very powerful tool. So as long as you have a system in place that measures the per perception of the employees, and you see that you know there's areas that you can improve on as a based as a, a result of those surveys, um, then you know that you've got a system that's that's continually working for you. And really, it all has to do with with accountabilities up the ladder. When you look at, at accountability, um, it's a very very important part and parcel of this process. That leads us into our next slide. When we talk about accountability, we're talking about one level being held accountable for a defined safety activity to the next level and up the chain right to the CEO and the upper management of the company. And it doesn't necessarily say I'm accountable for safety in general. Uh, you know, this accountability, again, is one that's very specific. So when you ask someone that has a zero injury culture or someone that works for a company that has a zero injury culture process, when you say, what are you responsible for in health and safety? 
they'll they'll say, well, I'm responsible for the health and safety of myself and those around me, which is great because that's the moral and ethical reasons that we're responsible. But they'll also be able to tell you about their accountabilities. And that, that's what this slide is all about, and that's what we're going to discuss in the next few slides here, is what, what does accountability mean? Now, when, traditionally, when we look at, at, at accountability, it might look like something like this. <clears throat> so the desired supervisor in this uh, example is to hold a daily safety meeting. The middle-level manager might do something like uh, ask the question, uh, you know, did you have your safety meetings? Uh, they might get a report or something that says, you know, who was there or who wasn't. Um, they might check for quantity, um, but that's probably as far as it goes. The senior level might get, again, reports of quantity. You know, they might get a report on who didn't have their required daily safety meetings. Uh, sometimes you don't even see senior safety leaders um, committed to that or as part of their um, accountabilities, and uh, more often than not, that's the way it happens. But there's, there's you know, often more levels between middle-level managers and desired, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, supervisor levels, and you have to think about, you know, what those accountabilities should look like, because right now what's happening is, in this example, it's kind of a traditional example where there's not a whole lot that gets done in terms of measuring quality and quantity. So when we look at accountability that works, this is what we're looking at, a model something like this. Again, the same desired activity. The activity is to truly connect with and engage your employees during daily safety meetings. So at the supervisor level, that's their accountability. And then, again, this is an example of only one safety accountability. Middle-level manager's accountability might read something like this. The middle-level manager has to sit in on two of those daily meetings and then recognize and coach the supervisor afterwards. So now we're getting into more of an engagement. The middle-level manager may ask the questions like, you know, what issues have you identified? What has changed as a result of, of your daily safety meetings? Again, this starts to get into checking for quality. And when those questions get asked often enough, the supervisor realizes that not only are we looking at quantity as to whether or not we're having these meetings, but quality as well. <clears throat> Again, coming through open-ended questions asked by that middle-level manager. Now, when we look at the senior level, senior level the senior le leader may, at a management meeting, of the himself and maybe the middle-level managers, asks two of those managers to talk about what they've done to improve the quality of their supervisor safety meetings. And that can be followed up with questions like, you know, what's resulting from having more engaged safety meetings? Which two supervisors conduct the most engaging safety meetings? Who are you working with on the quality of their safety meetings? So you can see that right up to the senior level, there's an accountability for the desired supervisor activity of holding a truly engaging safety meeting on a daily basis. And there's the difference between traditional accountability in safety activities and a zero injury culture type accountability, accountability that works where you have an accountability that goes right up the chain, right to the CEO of the company. Now, in speaking of accountabilities, the question has to be asked, well, what are we going to hold the people accountable for? In our next slide, what we'll see is what we call a safety river. And traditionally, what's happened is that we've held supervisors and we've held middle-level managers and upper-level managers uh, accountable for no fatalities, you know, and no recordables, and that's it. That's as far as it goes. Um, of course, those are results that everybody wants. But again, like we talked about in a previous slide, it really doesn't tell us necessarily how to get there. And if the goal is zero, or the, uh, what you're being held accountable for is only zero, what happens is, is that we find all kinds of creative ways to get there. And I'm sure that you don't have to put too much thought into thinking about uh, some creative methods of uh, 
giving uh, or uh, reporting zero injuries. It's something that happens uh, all over industry, whether we like to talk about it or not. What we need to focus expectations on are activities that supervisors can control. So what we need to, to focus on are things like, uh, you know, locking and tagging equipment, wearing proper personal protective equipment, quality pre-job safety meetings, equipment inspections, hazard identifications. All of these safety, um, defined safety activities that you'll see in a lot of traditional safety processes. It's not really something that's new, but we don't have accountabilities and expectations on those activities that get measured as far as quantity and quality is concerned. So there's the difference in that we need to focus on expectations on what we have control over. So these are what we call, um, these are what we call uh, pre-injury uh, activities. All right, they're not measuring necessarily the absence of injury, they're measuring the performance of safety activity. So those are where we need to focus our expectations on. And traditional processes um, don't necessarily uh, lend themselves well to tracking and measuring those kind of activities. You know, there's an old adage that says, what gets measured gets done, and that is so very true. And when you look at activities that occur and define safety activities, if you're going to be measuring those both in terms of quality and quantity, you will get to the no fatalities or no recordables um, desired result. All right, so the next step in the four steps to accountability has to do with training. We already talked about defining those safety activities. Now let's talk about training. In traditional systems, when we look at training, oftentimes, we, as far as safety training goes, we look at you know compliance required training, not necessarily focusing on skills. Uh, we look at um, uh, situations where the training is sometimes boring. Um, sometimes put this this training on when we get all kinds of people attending, but there's real and absent really an absence of upper management. Um, you know these training traditionally can be sign in and check out. Uh, it might be, uh, you know, lecture type where the supervisor is expected to know everything. Um, training can sometimes get to the point where our people, or participants say, well, look, this doesn't affect me, doesn't fit me. Sometimes training is, is done where one size fits all. So when you develop accountabilities, what you want to do is make sure that once you've got those accountabilities accountability defined, is to ensure that you have a training system in place to support that. And the best-in-class training, or zero-injury culture type of training, does things like, uh, you know, it's interactive and participative. Uh, the instruction cascades down. It's meaningful. It's communicated in such a way that employees understand exactly what it is that their, their uh, defined activities are, are requiring them to do. There's feedback. There's follow-through. Um, it's specific to an organization or specific to the team. It defines expectations. And then finally, it transfers well to the performance. And then there's always a, a, a follow-up in terms of ensuring that that training has stuck, if you will, and become part of the way they do business. So again, uh, the second part or the second step to developing a safety accountability that works is training. The next step in accountability has to do with measuring. And we've spoken about this uh, a few times already in the fact that, you know, what gets measured gets done. When we look at traditional measurement systems, oftentimes, again, we're only looking at injury numbers. You know, that's it. It's a focus on the absence of injury as opposed to the focus on the presence of safety. Oftentimes, the only thing that's focused on is quantity. You know, there's no quality measure. Um, sometimes these processes really in, in, increase the amount of paperwork that we do. Sometimes there's, there's no face-to-face -face interaction. Again, uh, asking folks just to measure uh, zero injuries is, isn't, really a lot of, isn't really something that we have direct control over, and a lot of them only measure failures, and that is, uh, you know, the injury. 
the best in class are the zero injury um, process uh, class looks at measurements that are precise. They're well defined and communicated. Not only do they measure things in a quantitative way, but they also look at the quality. And we've seen that again when you think back to the example of the accountability that works. There was a qual qualitative measure in there, and it's, it can be very, very simple. It's integrated with production. They are safety dues. They're part of daily culture. It measures activities at all levels. Again, specific activities at frontline, mid-level management, upper level. It measures what gets done. And again, it measures our efforts and our successes. So that's what the best in class looks like as far as measurements go. The next step in order to set accountabilities in a way that works is recognition. We really, really um, don't do a good job of recognition, typically, in industry. And when you look at recognition, traditionally recognition has only been based on numbers. So, you know, um, you go for so long without an injury and we're going to recognize you for that, and that's the only thing that we do. These measurement systems can suppress reporting. I'm sure that some of you, if you think about it, you don't have to think too long about, you know, about it in order to come up with a story or two how someone has not reported an incident or reported an injury because they're going to affect the safety record or the safety reward for the entire organization or themselves. Some of these processes can be arbitrary. They can be subjective. Um, some of these processes, again, are untimely, uncertain. They can, be, they can be perceived as negative as well. On the flip side of the coin, when you look at something that really works, recognizing performance can take a simpler path and be much more effective. Simple recognition, short-term and long-term recognition processes can be put in place. Um, recognition you know, equal to productivity and quality. So just as you're getting recognized for uh, quality issues and, or and uh, production issues, so too are you being recognized for your, for your um, activities and safety. Again, uh, maybe tied to individual activities, just as we saw in the activity that, uh, our accountabilities at work. They'd be significant enough to provide an atmosphere for motivation. When you're doing recognition in a positive way, um, it's fair and it's objective. Um, and oftentimes, this type of recognition is, again, very simple. It's immediate, it's certain, it's positive. And when we talk about recognition, it can be, it can be verbal recognition. It can be um, tangible recognition, although tangible recognition has to be done very carefully, and that's a whole other presentation. So those are the four steps of accountability and when you look at accountability, again, what you'll see is a couple things here. An effective safety culture has an accountability that's interwoven throughout the organization. So again, there's accountabilities that are laid out and clearly understood by frontline employees, by supervisors and team leads, by middle-level managers, by senior leaders. You know, everybody's engaged in the system. They help build it. That's a real key. When you get into this transition from traditional to world class or to zero injury, it's very, very, very important to help people get involved in building that, building that process or improving what you have to make it better, to make it fit for zero injury culture. It also defines each person's role. So safety actions are known. So someone would say, you know, in my position, what I can do to ensure your your safety, my safety is, and they'll go on with their safety, defined safety activities. Again, we get into the training to make sure that each person has to know how to do the things they're being held accountable for. Again, we've got a measurement. You know, someone's checking, checking up. Someone keeps bringing it up. You've got to be prepared to give an account of what you're being measured on. And, of course, there's recognition built into the process as well. One of the important things is that Support for this process has to come from the, from the top. The support in order to make this work has to come from the top. I repeat that because it's so important. This process only works very, very limited if you do not have senior leaders total buy-in and support. And what I mean by that 
is not only are they giving it good intention and saying that, yes, you know, this process is important, this transition is important, we need to change the way we do things, but they understand that they have things that they need to do. And what's interesting is recently I, I facilitated a continuous improvement team um, at a large um, electrical utility in the Midwest and in the USA. And um, the senior leader, the CEO of the company, came into the rapid improvement workshop and voiced his approval and his support for that continuous improvement team. And he said, I support 100% what you're doing. And I'm thinking, okay, this is intention. And at the very end, what he said was something that really demonstrates the support that you need. What he said at the end was, please let me know specifically what it is that you want me to do. And that's the kind of leadership support that we're talking about. And it has to go right through from the top leadership right through to the frontline supervisor and into the, into, in, into the uh, front line. The accountability on the other side goes up the chain, if you will. Employees are being held accountable by their supervisors. Supervisors are being held accountable and measured by their mid-level managers. Mid-level managers are being held accountable by their senior leaders and CEOs. And in some companies, it goes as high as board of directors. And that is what accountability looks like across all levels. Again, support comes from the top. Accountability comes from the bottom up. This slide is going to demonstrate for you what the various levels of safety processes, where they'll get you. When we look at level number one, we're looking at a safety process or a company that only reacts. Their safety program deals with compliance issues. The only time that they have uh, safety is being something that's forefront is when a government agency comes in and says, you know, we're going to slap this work order on you and shut you down. There's an ensuing investigations. This level of, of uh, safety management, you know, men have meetings, but these meetings are a check-in, check-out sort of thing. Nobody moves, nobody gets hurt. And at that performance, if you will, you can have very high incident rates, and you really probably won't get any better. Level number two. Level number two starts getting into a change. Now level number two, we start looking at things that are happening and activities that are happening before incidents occur. So we might have things like job observations, job safety analyses, you know, near miss reporting, inspections, and we start to get involved in that kind of stuff. Well, we can still have high incident rates and have that very traditional approach by not going any, and not going any further. When we get up the ladder and see more of a change, we start to realize that it's what we do. We start to see safety accountability systems being thought about. We start to see safety accountability systems being implemented. Level number four takes us a little higher. Level number four starts again with what we call a unseen cultural reality. You know, there's surveys that are undertaken by the organization, interviews to find out exactly what employees' perception of the safety process is. Level number four, we also see some of that cultural spillover into our own personal lives. Um, you know, for an example, I worked with a company that implemented a park to pull away policy. And what happened was is that we started seeing people coming back and saying, you know, I've parked to pull away with this company for years and my family does it too. So you start to see, you know, even a spillover into people's personal lives at level number four. And your incident rates, when everything's being done well at level four, will remain will remain low and you're well on your way. Number five talks about a real engagement. This is where we take results from our interviews and surveys, and we use effective data to drive safety teams to look at how we can implement improvements to the process. So everybody's trying to work again on continually improving. Level number six is where we really need to get, and that's how we lead. This is where we see culture in action. This is where participation is part and parcel of the way we do business. Day in, day out, we wouldn't consider doing business any other way. There's an ownership around safety. There's a passion around safety. Again, safety would never be seen as a bolt-on. It's, a, it's an, a level that you want to get to that continually improves safety, and it never stops. And it's all, again, part and parcel of the way you do business at this level. And that's 
where you start approaching zero, and that's very important. So when you look at transitional, you can look at the bottom level as being really bare bones, traditional level one, to the top where you're really seeing it, culture in action, that's where you want to be. Well, how do you get there? You know, what, what are, what's the process of getting there? Well, the next slide that you're looking at right now looks a little bit like the Plan, Do, Check, Act wheel that has been used in continuous improvement for years. And the way it works is that at the top we have an engagement. So the management at a particular organization will say, you know what, there's an issue here, we want to improve, we're, we're good, but we need to get better, you know, let's engage. So they'll do an assessment. And this sometimes, again, is things like a safety perception survey. It's a good way to assess the perception of the employees and what they think about the safety process. The next step says, okay, well now we're going to build. We're going to build a process where we have teams in place, we have a steering team in place, we have continuous improvement teams that are, that are addressing the issues that we've come across through our assessments. We've again got a steering team that's going to be in place uh, from this point forward that's going to help us improve. We develop and implement solutions that are that again comes through the involvement of all uh, of employees at all levels. We have a check um, step to that where we're checking what we've implemented to see that it's working, to tweak it along the way. Sometimes we realize that we have to go back and we have to tweak things three or four different times when we check them. And then that circles right back again to another assessment that you continue to do. I've seen companies that have been very successful in this wheel and what they typically do is have a uh, employee perception survey of all employees over a broad range of topics approximately every two years so that they're continually assessing and continually being, being able to build, develop, implement, and check. And that's the process. It's a complex process. It can be very complicated at times, but it's a process that you have to go through in order to get from traditional to transformational or to a zero injury culture. And that wraps up what, I'm, uh, what I've got for you today. Um, thank you for your, for your time. Uh, we'll uh, entertain the questions. Yes, Doug, thanks so much to you. Uh, this is Abby again, everyone. Thank you for submitting your comments and questions for Doug. I will read them now and get his responses. First of all, Doug, could you provide a little bit of clarity on the enterprise safety metric that you mentioned early in the presentation? Can you explain how RIF or recordable injury frequency is calculated? Yeah, hang on a second. Okay, um, injury frequencies are, um, are done using a, um, a, a formula and it, um, I, I'm a, I'm a, I must say I'm not familiar exactly with what, uh, what we're using for a, uh, a formula that looks at uh, hours worked and the uh, incident uh, occurrences. Um, we can get back with specifics to the person that asked that question. Uh, sure. Uh, as, as, as with such a big organization, we have there are a couple of different methods that are used, and I must confess I, I'm not familiar with what, which one we use. Sure, no problem. I will follow up with that information later. Second question is kind of a comment too. Uh, At-risk behaviors don't always cause an incident. Most of the time, they do not, which is why employee, why people would do those behaviors. Is that right? Oh yes. No, there are at-risk behaviors don't necessarily end up in a in a, um, a result situation. At-risk behaviors are are occur as well in in uh, in near misses. It's just that when we do have an incident, uh, when we look at it, we can say that a lot of the root causes do have something to do with an at-risk behavior. But yes, that comment is totally true. There are thousands and thousands of at-risk behaviors. Not all of them cause uh, uh, an undesired result. That's a, that's a good point. All righty. Uh, next question is, can you provide some examples of middle management safety activities, and I will note that this came through as you were presenting the six criteria, and you probably did cover some of those. I know you covered some of those in the subsequent slides, but you might reiterate, what are 
some specific activities that middle, middle managers can conduct in order to demonstrate their active involvement in safety management? Certainly, that's, uh, that's a simple question to answer. When we look at safety activities, we'll look at a particular activity. Um, let's take um, a safety meeting, monthly safety meeting. So at the front line, you say, okay, we have to have monthly safety meetings. The front line supervisor ensures that those meetings are occurring. The uh, middle level managers are the ones that are checking on whether or not the front line supervisors are conducting those meetings or doing, doing whatever they have to do, whatever they're responsible for as far as that safety accountability goes. So it's got more to do with a single safety accountability that works, that, that has accountabilities right up the chain. So when you ask yourself the question, or when the question is asked, you know, what kind of things are middle level managers being held accountable for, or what kind of activities uh, would they have, or accountabilities? Well, they would have the accountability to say, hey, the people that report to me, you know, if, they have the, if the accountability is uh, monthly safety meetings, the people that report to me, A, are they having them? in terms of quantity, are they seeing quality results? And one of those other accountabilities might be that that middle level manager has to sit in on one of those meetings and then as a result, coach and commend the supervisor who conducted the meeting on, on, on their, um, their performance, if you will. I hope that clears it up. So that All we, right. have, we have accountabilities for middle level managers just as we do for, for front level upper managers for every safety accountability that we measure. That's right. And just want to throw out there to all the folks posing questions, if you feel like we haven't sufficiently answered your question, please do reach out to us after the webinar and we'll be happy to have a conversation with you and make sure we get your question fully answered. The next question, Doug, is have these ideas and concepts been implemented in remote or distributed workforces where a supervisor is not immediately present? Can you share any lessons learned from your own experiences with this? Yes, I can. Um, as a matter of fact, the utility company that I worked for um, for seven years, uh, we embarked on this process and it was a challenge. It was very much a challenge uh, when we had remote locations. And uh, what I'll say is that the best solution and the best answer to that question lies within the people that, that developed that defined activity. And this goes right back again to flexibility. What works for, um, you know, we might have an accountability in our, in our organization that says, you know, hold a monthly safety meeting. Well, that's lovely if we've got everybody in one spot, but what happens when we get you know, two people in a remote location? How do we tackle that? And I'll tell you, I've seen this work time and time and time again. The way you tackle that is you get the people together and you ask them what will work. It's, you know, it, it sounds like it, it's such a simple answer and it works. Ask the folks, what, it, what is it that works for? What will, what will work? All right. On the topic of recognition, Doug, can you provide some specific examples of short-term versus long-term recognitions? Sure. Short-term recognition is something that's immediate. So we're talking about simple recognition. Um, you know, we're on a work site and I see Abby donning a fall arrest harness, and perhaps this is something that we've just implemented. And I watch her as she inspects her harness before she puts it on. And I walk up and I say, Abby, I see that you're putting your, you're doing your inspection before you put your harness on. That's really, really important. You know, there's been injuries that have occurred from, from ill-fitting harnesses. Thank you for doing that. That's simple recognition. What we realize is that the more we do that, the more people are apt to repeat that safe behavior. Long-term recognition might be something totally different. It might be something like, um, you know, George is the is the frontline supervisor and has been uh, been doing uh, monthly safety meetings 100% uh, of the time and has been doing an, an, a phenomenal job at um, getting quality results. And it's been proven by the uh, a the number of times I can black and white measure quantity in, and b the the answers that I'm getting and the results that I'm seeing from activities that come out of that safety meeting. So therefore, we're going to recognize George, um, you know, with a tangible item. Or recognize George at a management meeting.
Thank you, Doug. Next question is, what are your suggestions about safety orientations for new employees? Cramming all the information into one long day or breaking it down over time? All right, this is uh, near and dear to my heart as I had a lot of experience developing, implementing, and giving employee, uh, new employee orientation. Do not do this in one day. It's, it's good to have a plan of onboarding, and I like that word better. Onboarding a new employee um, should include uh, some critical things that you want to communicate on day one, but having a plan in place that might go over a period of time, whether it's one month, whether it's six months, or whatever the case may be, so that this employee doesn't get inundated with you know three days of uh, of safety information that they're expected to then put into place. There's a real danger associated with uh, cramming too much into a new employee orientation. So my answer again, put an onboarding process together. Talk about some critical things that you need to talk about on day one, but ensure that it's being followed up in a timely manner that will stick. Okay, and on the same lines as, along the same lines as training, what is your opinion or feelings about canned or off-the-shelf safety programs? That's a good question. I have seen some off-the-shelf safety processes or programs work to a certain extent. And I will tell you this, those programs are only as good as the effort that you put into it. And it sounds simple. But it is so very, very true. Uh, I'm not going to um, uh, name any of the ones that I've had experiences with, but again, I've seen ones that, that uh, uh, you know, a, a company will try to sell you the magic wand or the silver bullet, and you try to implement it, and two years down the road, you walk through, or two years down the process, you walk through the, uh, uh, the warehouse, and up on the top shelf is this dusty magic wand that this company sold you. I've also seen processes that have been put into place where there's been a real effort in trying to see how it fits into our culture and see what we can do in order to make the pieces of that safety program off the shelf work, how we can personalize it for us. I think that's the key. Okay, Doug, uh, next question is, does discipline still have a place in reaching safety goal of zero, and is it difficult to keep things positive after discipline within a group? That's another question that, that I've had experience wrestling in. And one of the things that we have to realize is that <clears throat> discipline, if we're talking about progressive discipline, it's, in my definition, it's, it's focused on a lack of performance. So there's been some sort of lack of performance. Now, discipline, um, again, for a, a, a performance issue, you know, it's already gone beyond the, the coaching. It's already gone beyond all that stuff. It's in a realm all, all to its own. Uh, discipline has to be taken very, very, done very, very, very carefully. Um, you know, there has to be a lot of coaching and stuff that's proven uh, first. If the employee is still negligent and there's discipline that needs to follow, then it needs to follow. But you don't give up discipline and just say, okay, now we're going to just, you know, go into this positive recognition. And when we teach positive recognition, what we teach is that for every coaching opportunity, you should have to, you should be able to identify seven positive, um, uh, positive reinforcements that you've done, not necessarily with that particular um, activity. But it's a seven to one ratio so that, you know, you do not give up on the coaching and discipline part, but you, you supplement how you operate, how you, how you mentor with a lot more positive recognition, focusing on those specific activities that you want to see repeated. All right. Thanks, Doug. That concludes all of the questions that were posed by our uh, participants today. I want to thank everybody uh, for proposing those. I want to also share with you, Doug, that several people thanked you for your presentation and noted that they found value in it. So I'd like to extend my thanks to you as well. Also, I want to direct everyone um, to our 
final slide, there we go. Doug, can you uh, advance to the final slide there? And direct everybody to safety.cat.com slash webinars where you can view our previous webinars. We have them archived there. You can sign up for our next webinar event, which we will have posted here shortly. And um, send any inquiries to us that way or through safety services at cat.com. So I want to thank everybody for participating today. Please do get in touch with us if you have any additional questions about what Doug delivered today or any questions about how Caterpillar can support you in your safety journey. So thanks, everyone. Have a terrific rest of the day. Bye-bye. Everyone, bye-bye.